Greetings folks, your friendly neighborhood Rick Disgate here. Uh, in this video, I want to discuss the idea of sacrifice, as well as touch on the topic of objective versus subjective, just a little bit. Now, two unweighted topics, yes, but please wait and see just why I am discussing both in the same video. Now, the Cartesian Theist recently made a video called What About Sacrifice? which will be linked below, of course. He asked the question, do you think sacrificing your life for others can be noble? So I answered with a question of my own in the comment section. I have a question. Many Christians are so confident of going to heaven after they die, correct? So where is this sacrifice you are speaking of? According to your theology, life goes on and on and on in a different form. The real heroes, the ones who truly sacrifice something, are the ones that do not believe in an afterlife. When they die, they aren't doing it with the expectation of any reward or glory. Now the Cartesian theist responded with, You had two questions. The answer to the confidence question is that they mostly do, yes. But this confidence is not due to anything they have done or how good they are. Their confidence is in the one who saved them. The second question is answered in one word, Jesus. The rest of what you said honestly does not make a lot of sense, and I don't really know what you mean by it. Sorry. For some reason, the Cartesian theist doesn't understand that I was using a rhetorical question within the intended question, I guess. The question about confidence in the afterlife, just so everyone's on the same page, was the rhetorical portion. So, instead, he addressed the rhetorical question and then claimed to be confused by the way I worded or phrased the actual question being asked and answered with a single word, Jesus, which seems based on a very literal interpretation of my actual question. I admit that my comment was hastily and somewhat clumsily drafted. That's what passion plus a complex topic and a 500 character limit will get you sometimes. I apologize for my muddled wording, and I do hope this sentiment will find the forgiving part of the Cartesian theist mind receptive. But my question, so where is this sacrifice you are speaking of, is tied directly to the rhetorical part. I am referring to the general universal idea of sacrifice, not a specific example such as your answer, Jesus. But anyways, speaking of Jesus, he has his own teaching on sacrifice, and my views echo his moral teaching on this topic. In Mark 12, 41-44, we have the parable of the widow's two mites. Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury, and saw how the people put money into the treasury, and many who were rich put in much. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which makes a quadrants. So he called his disciples to himself and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. For they all put in out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. Now this parable is used for many moral lessons. And here's my spin. Can you see the parallel between my sentiments on sacrifice and the teachings of Jesus? Do you not see how the rich ones are the same as those who believe they will live on in heaven after this life? That's exactly what Jesus was pointing out. The rich are making no sacrifice by virtue of the fact that they can easily afford to do such things. Do you not see how the poor widow represents the non-believer? To Jesus, the widow was the one who actually made a real sacrifice, even though her two mites paled in comparison to the large sums offered by the rich, her two mites represented her only means for continuing to live. She willingly sacrificed them, knowing she had no other support to turn to. Here's a mathematical way, by no means meant as some rigorous mathematical proof of my opinion of sacrifice, it's just another way of picturing it, of stating what I mean by the non-believer's act of giving their life for another, being a sacrifice worthy of note as compared with someone who believes they would live on even after earthly death. It is very simple. Now in the believer's case, the formula would look something like one life earthly plus one life afterlife or heaven would equal two lives. And if they made a sacrifice of their earthly life, it would look like this. Two lives minus one life earthly would equal one life heavenly or the afterlife. 
So the Weaver is in the envious position of ending up netting one heavenly life after disposing of this earthly one. Not bad. Now the non-believer's formula would look somewhat similar. One life earthly plus zero life heavenly equals one life earthly. And with the sacrifice of this earth, earthly life, one life minus one life earthly would equal zero life. Now the non-believer not only suffers from a net loss of all life, they also face the fact that when this experience ends, it means a complete dissolution of the experiencer and any possibility of further experience. Whereas the believer still has a hope of continuing on in some way that is very similar to our earthly experience, according to some, but on the scale of a godly perfection and completion. Of course, I did try to reply with an attempt to clarify my point further to the Cartesian Theus previous comment, but another YouTuber, Fresh Eyeball, came to my support with the following analogy. I think the point Rick Desgate was trying to make is that if life is extremely finite and the afterlife eternal, then if you know for a certainty that you are going to spend that afterlife in heaven, then how is it possible to look at any of your actions as sacrifice. Even death to save another is hardly a sacrifice, in the same way that pushing my car off a cliff is not a sacrifice, if I am standing next to a new Ferrari with my name on it. Now the Cartesian theist chose to continue the conversation with Fresh Eyeball with this response. This is a rather curious question. I think the false assumption behind the question is that this life pales into insignificance in light of eternity, and I do not agree it does. This life is still extremely precious. Should a person sacrifice their life in this life, they have still given up their time in this life with their family and friends, etc. This is why the car analogy fails so badly. This is the first time I have heard such a claim from a theist or from someone who believes in eternity in heaven. This statement raises a few issues. How does the Cartesian theist know such specific details about the mental life of heavenly souls? How does he determine whether this life or the next one are more or less significant than one another? Or wouldn't you need to have your earthly life memories intact upon entering heaven? in order to make the above determination? And if you have your memories intact, wouldn't that include any negative memories? Which would make heaven not so blissful, I would think. So I decided to reply to this comment from the Cartesian theist. What you are failing to parse is the fact that your beliefs include some sort of afterlife. I don't care about the quality or particular things you can do in said afterlife. You still believe you will live on, period. Whereas the non-believer is of the mind that this life is it, period. He or she sacrifices themselves. They are gone forever. A believer in the afterlife sacrifices themselves and poof, they're in heaven or hell, all set for a brand new universe of experience. You get it? And the Cartesian theist replied to my comment, Of course I understand that, but what you have failed to explain, via anything other than subjective opinion, is how that would make it any more noble in any objective sense. You may subjectively feel one is more sacrificial than the other, but there is no compulsion to agree with you. I still think the qualitative difference in the sacrifice of Jesus makes it far more sacrificial. The non-believer does not sacrifice eternal fellowship with God. So, he does eventually come around to at least an understanding of what I was getting at. Job done, right? But no. And here's where the topic of subjective versus objective rears its ugly head. The Cartesian theist suddenly brings up the fact that my opinion is just subjective. As if to say that all subjective opinions have no place and are not valid. Well, yes, TCT, what I stated is my opinion. And no, I cannot point to some objective source to substantiate my opinion. So what? Neither can you. 
And what would be the point anyways? If you don't agree, then tell me why. Instead of making a special pleading to some requirement for an outside uber authority to grant you permission to agree with my opinion or not, or to tell you whether my opinion is correct or not, this is a tactic that I have seen many theists use. When backed into a corner on some topic, they suddenly board out, subjective bad, objective good. A red herring, as far as I can see, this tactic is the doorway to special pleading when there's nowhere else to turn. In effect, TCT is saying that there is a form of sacrifice that we humans have, and there's, then there's a special type of sacrifice that only God can do. And that is the only truly objectively noble form of sacrifice, simply by the virtue of that special form of pleading. Now what is it with some theists? who can't seem to form their own opinions or evaluations without wanting to plead to some ultimate authority of some sort. It's like an adult of 70 who still wants to hassle his father of 93 over every little decision in life. An adult who doesn't want to take responsibility for themselves, for their own actions, for their own opinions, for their own statements. And an adult that seems convinced of the poisonous theological concepts of humans being nothing but prone to error and evil. Therefore, any human thought that cannot be tied to some objective base is therefore immediately suspect and not worth considering. Why is an objective authority required in order for me to state an opinion that I am certain that the vast majority of people, including your savior, if asked, would agree with anyways? The Cartesian theist also states, and this is the special pleading argument, as I said, I think it's the qualitative nature of this sacrifice which makes it exceptional. One person in the Godhead is cutting himself away from the other two. No human being can make such a severe sacrifice. According to the speculations of TCT, and I call them speculations because he has nothing to back them up with but his own subjective opinions and interpretations of the biblical text and his own notions of what he perceives as convictions of the truth via the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. Now this qualitative difference, if quality can even be objectively determined, sets the sacrifice of Jesus apart and above all other sacrifices. According to TCT, Jesus underwent an ordeal that no human can even fathom, let alone have the potential to partake in themselves. Yet it's something that TCT seems to know some details about somehow. That when Jesus died on the cross, the triune God was for a finite period of time just a duo. So what? Jesus was separated for a time? And yes, for that brief period of time, he did indeed sacrifice something. Communion with the other two persons of the Trinity. But how is a temporary sacrifice any different from someone undergoing a painful operation only to fully recover? Jesus is ultimately reunited with the triune God, fully intact, unchanged, because he is by nature unchanging. Which makes me wonder whether Jesus on the cross could be considered a sacrifice of any sort. Sacrifice by its very definition requires a dramatic and non-reversible loss or change of some sort. Besides all that, wasn't this part of the gospel salvation plan to begin with? Now, I'm not even going to bother lending any further credence to TCT speculations, because in my opinion, they amount to nothing more than special pleading and the reaction of someone who would do anything possible to protect their particular picture of their faith. And I, for one, am tired of this petulant form of argument, period. Thank you for your time and for lending me your minds for at least a few moments. Until next time.